Before I call the meeting to order, it looks like we may have some students in the crowd. Would you like to tell us why, why you're here and are you here for a class? Have to or get to. Nice, nice. And it looks like Southwest. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, thank you for being here. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you. Welcome, you guys. I, we would love to have more young people attend these meetings. So that's fantastic. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting to order. Uh, let's see here. Looks like uh, reports from board advisory committees. We have uh, three reports. We are going to start with finance and operations. The finance and operations committee met on March 28th in the Board of Education room. Dave Arterbury with uh, Stiefel Nicholas reviewed a, a potential bond refunding opportunity for the district for the 2015 AEB bonds. If interest rates do not uh, materially increase, the refunding bonds would be sold in June. District administration reviewed the proposed meal prices, transportation fee fees, facility rental fees, and academic fee schedules for 24-25. These are on the consent agenda for the board this evening. Bids and contracts were reviewed by administration, and, and this is also a consent agenda item. Next meeting is scheduled for May 9th. Next up is the Communications Committee. The Communications Committee met, and the focus of our discussion was around crisis communications. Um, crisis communications ranging from the everyday things that occasionally happen to um, preparedness from internal and external communication that needs to take place. Uh, the group uh, took a look at the plans and the processes that we use, and uh, we asked them for feedback, and um, that pretty much took up the majority of our meeting. So the meeting concluded at 8.30. And finally, health and well-being with Dr. Schmidt. The Health and Well-Being uh, Board Advisory Committee met on March 6th, and our topic was uh, protective factors in mental health and well-being. Uh, the first presentation was with Sondra Wallace, who is a trainer with Sources of Strength. The mission of uh, SOS is to pre uh, prevent adverse outcomes by increasing well-being, help-seeking, resiliency, healthy coping, and belonging. The center or the program centers around peer-led engagement and focuses on eight protective factors. Following that presentation, uh, Sylvia Harrell and B.J. Thomas Wilson, developers of Gimme 20, uh, a suicide prevention program, uh, presented and talked about the program that they helped to develop after they both experienced losses in their life with their children. Um, they have both uh, presented this program to d uh, districts and schools across Johnson County, um, and their program is called Gimme 20, and what they do is they do a lot of thought-provoking uh, discussions and then create a life box that is something that kids can take with them and remind them of the things that makes life worth living for them. Uh, finally, we had a student panel who came in and reflected on how both SOS and Give Me 20 has changed their lives. Uh, several of the students actually talked about how this, these projects did prevent them from considering suicide moving forward. It was a very uh, powerful uh, discussion by the, by the students. Our next presentation is on, our next uh, meeting is on April 24th in this, in this room. And that concludes our committee reports. All right, moving along. Reports from board members and superintendent, and I am going to start with Clay Norkey. <laughs> Thank you. I'm um, just going to report on some of the things that uh, we uh, I've uh, attended and gone to throughout the district since our last meeting. Um, did go to the communications me committee meeting, which was uh, very informative on crisis management. 
Um, that was good. Got to sit in on that. Um, met with uh, Corey Moan over at CAPS, BV CAPS, um, uh, actually CAPS Network to talk about the larger CAPS Network and also Chad Ralston to talk about BV CAPS a little bit. Um, that was really good. Went to the State of the City address for Overland Park. Of course, we had spring break in there, which was kind of nice. Um, the school tours continued, went over to Overland Trail Middle School and Elementary Schools. Prairie Star Middle and Elementary, and then went over to Stanley, where some of my kids went, and got to see a lot of teachers that I had not seen in more than a decade, and it was that was really cool. Um, the Heartland Glow Show, the percussion group over at Heartland Elementary, the percussion group was fantastic. They do a glow-in-the-dark uh, percussion show. Um, that was just, I think, last week. Um, Dr. Merrigan was there. Gina was there. Um, anybody else there? That was... Uh, that was pretty cool to see those fifth graders uh, jamming on the drums and all in glow in the dark and glowing. It was, it was really neat. Um, also attended the Suicide Prevention Coalition of Johnson County monthly meeting. We had the Labor Department in to talk about ensuring that folks know their rights and benefits under federal law when it comes to mental health services, both um, from the federal government and also under um, with their insurance companies and talked about a Shatter the Stigma walk put on by a friend of mine over in the Olathe School District, um, a friend who lost a son to suicide last summer and they're doing a walk for awareness um, next month. So that wraps up my month. Fantastic. Patrick? I'm good. All right, Sonia. On Tuesday, March the 21st, um, Jan and Jody, we met up in Topeka for the KSAB um, day. And we had an opportunity to actually be on the floor with the legislators. We met a lot of them and they brought a lot of bills to the floor and, and it was very interesting and I met a lot of interesting people. <laughs> and, uh, and it was a great day. Fantastic, thank you. Jan. Thank you. Um, and as Sonia said, uh, she and I rode over together and then hooked, met, met up with Jody at, for the uh, advocacy day. And uh, we did get to, um, we learned a lot of background about education bills that were still pending and all the negotiations going on that are in conference committee this week. Uh, working especially hard on getting uh, special ed funding uh, as required by law. Um, let's see, what else should I do? Witness, let's see, Jody and I, were Clay, did you go to the State of the City talk? Yes, we did. We heard uh, all the great outlook for the city of Overland Park. Did, were you there too? No. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying you were. Uh, I read uh, to kindergarten and first graders at um, Sunrise Point and also Aspen Grove Elementary. Uh, what a blast that was. Uh, but I also share your opinion, uh, Donya, about uh, it, it takes a special special person to be able to uh, herd those cats. Um, and then I was also at the uh, Communications Committee. I think that's it. That's good enough. Good enough. Thanks, Jim. Okay, Jim. Um, I just want to uh, welcome our, I don't know if it's been announced, so I'm not going to say the name, but our new principal at Morse Elementary. And I had, oh, we haven't approved it yet. Okay, well, I think it's coming. Um, um, but uh, <laughs> I also had the opportunity to uh, visit with uh, some of the families over at Morse, and they just got together and did a, a little um, uh, donut and thing that was neat. they care about their community I think every one of our elementary schools has that same you know sense of families that come together to and support their schools and so it's great to see thanks Jim Gina I just want to let everybody know about an event on April 26th that our special ed advisory council is putting on which is the ability showcase it's at Blue Valley West 
Um, they didn't do it last year, and so they're back this year, and it's one of the best events that we put on district-wide, I think. Um, and so hopefully everybody can make it. It's, fr it's a Friday night, and it showcases performing arts and visual arts, and it's really quite amazing. Dr. Merrigan. You bet. If Kyle will pull up, or Mike, one of you. Thank you. We've had a lot happen since the last uh, board meeting, so. There we go. Uh, very first, uh, we have 23 high school singers who have been chosen as semifinalists for uh, KC Superstar. Um, and then you can see here are the Blue Valley uh, semifinalists from Southwest, from Northwest, from Blue Valley High. Um, so we congratulate them and wish them luck as they move forward. I don't know, you guys not going. Uh, it appears so. There we go. Um, national Civics Bee. So there is a National Civics Bee that the Overland Park Chamber um, has been sponsoring. And so the first step is to find our county winners. And I am happy to say that all eight of the finalists for the county are from Blue Valley, from our middle schools. So shout out to Kelly and Jennifer from our curriculum team over here because they're the ones who spearheaded this uh, with our buildings. So uh, we're very excited for uh, these eight to compete and three from our county will go on to the state competition. So we know we'll have three in the state competition. Uh, Blue Valley West student, Arsalan Syed, uh, will be speaking at an eclipse event. Um, which is pretty exciting for the Astrom Astronomical Society of Kansas. Uh, two Blue Valley students were among the top winners uh, in the state math counts competition, Edison Chen from Oxford and Jaden Wu from uh, Pleasant Ridge Middle, so congratulations to them. Uh, Blue Valley Northwest senior Joey Mattioni was named an all-state selection in Keisha Top 5. Um, he's had a phenomenal senior season. I think he might have been the EKL player of the year as well. Um, from Blue Valley North, Jalea Davis was named the Keisha Top 5 selection and the Sports in Kansas 6A Girls Basketball Player of the Year. Um, and she is just a junior, uh, averaged 24 points a game, and lead, led the Mustangs to a third place finish at state. Also in girls basketball from Blue Valley High School, um, also OSU uh, basketball uh, commit uh, Jaden Wooten was named the Gatorade Player of the Year for the state of Kansas, as well as the Keisha Top 5 selection. Uh, congratulations to Harmony Middle School 8th grader Alton um, and his teacher, Mrs. Um, Kingitar, for placing first in the middle school division at the Kansas State Art Show. Blue Valley Northwest dance team placed third in the nation for team performance at nationals in Orlando. Uh, the team also competed in jazz and game day categories. Um, Blue Valley High's show choir competed at Fame Orlando and won lots of trophies, as you can see there, um, including the grand champion. So congratulations to them. Uh, Blue Valley West Choir traveled to Hawaii uh, for the World String Heritage Performance Festival, and you can see there. Uh, um, awards as well, Sweepstakes Award, which is the highest combined score of all competing schools. Um, we ho recently hosted a uh, Zoom event for realtors, and we have another one coming up on April 9th. Um, so if you're a realtor listening to this, uh, we want you to join in, and we engaged in some um, question and answer with that group, as well as shared some um, information with them about our district. Uh, the 2024 Blue Valley Today issue highlights uh, Blue Valley uh, Millican Award winner um, on the Andrew La or Lahash Alex Lahasky on the cover there, as well as some district's mental health commitments. So check your mailboxes if you have not uh, to view that copy. Um, this is really. Uh, a testament to the Blue Valley District. So every year, um, every state in the union has uh, students who are named presidential scholar candidates. That means they can apply to be a presidential scholar. At the end of this whole process, in May, there will be two from the state. We have 37 students who qualified as candidates who are going on in this process. Um, there's about probably 90-ish 
in the entire state so we have close to a third of them are more than a third of them i believe so congratulations to all of those students um, some celebrations that are happening in april it's national occupation therapy month it's school library month that's an important month um, for our school libraries paraprofessional day uh, national library week administrative professionals day so we'll be celebrating lots of different things throughout april um oh <laughs> And then, hey. that, that's me, I Just guess. Tell us about this one. <laughs> yeah, this is good. Um, yeah, so thank you to uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha for their recognition um, on that award. I appreciate that. And then the only other thing that I wanted to share is that this is the time of year, um, although we have a little bit of weather tonight, but... We typically are through inclement weather type things by this time, so we announced the last day of school. Uh, so the last day of school will be on Friday, May 24th. On Friday, May 24th will be a half a day for students, um, and they'll be out uh, at various times, depending on if you're in elementary, middle, or high, but, but it's a half of a day for you. And then teachers will conclude on the following Tuesday. They have grade prep the following Tuesday. Um, to wrap all of our grades up. So communication will be going out, but I typically announce that at a board meeting first. So that's what I have. Excellent, excellent. Um, oh, um, so I will just add, um, yeah, I was able to get a finance um, meeting, which is always riveting, riveting, I say. Um, uh, that's actually the first finance meeting I've ever been to, so... It was, it was good, yeah. Um, health and well-being. Um, Dr. Uh, Schmidt talked about um, um, the, the measures, the, the programs we have in place for mental well-being for our students and um, mentioned a little bit about uh, the students that were there talking about their experiences. And um, that was incredibly powerful to hear um, how important these measures that we've put in place here are to our student population. And there was one extremely um, professional, sharp individual um, from the academy that shared um, their experience because they, my understanding is a recent implementation of some of these programs um, and um, how important it was um, at the academy. And it was, it was very powerful. So I really appreciated that. Um, yeah, State of the City is great. We always get a shout out and we try to make for sure that they do acknowledge our wonderful public schools here um, in Overland Park, which, um, which the, uh, the mayor did. Uh, I think I've been to Topeka twice maybe since the last board meeting. Is that, is that right? I think so. Jan would know because I get stuck with him uh, on that too, so that's been great. Um, Let's see here. Yes, I uh, had the opportunity to read uh, to some kindergartners at Aspen Grove. It was so much fun. Um, read one of my favorite books, um, um, Officer Buckle, and I brought a puppet, and uh, it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> it was absolutely fantastic. I had a great time, um, and I think the kids did too. They really liked meeting Gloria, um, so that was great. Um, to Gina's Ability Showcase, I've been in the past, and it is an absolute uh, joy to go to. Don't miss um, the show. It's, it's worth um, your time. Um, if they ask for money at the door, it's worth it. It's absolutely fantastic. Our students are so talented. Um, and then I would like to do a shout out to the Women's Giving Circle um, event, which is this week. Um, our Ed Foundation, um, a couple years ago, um, started a Women's Giving Circle um, to kind of focus on some um, projects around the district um, and, and kind of unite women uh, in, in um, kind of um, choosing to support some of these uh, kind of special uh, endeavors. So um, I plan to be there, and I believe Dr. Merrigan might be there. And, others so it's a it's a great event so i think that's all i have for right now jody i just want to shout shout out to you i went and read at aspen grove a day or two after you did and you are now a legend over there they couldn't stop talking about the uh the puppet and i felt very inadequate coming without a puppet but you know, we made that. We made that is true. That was the goal, right? No, it was. Uh, it was so much fun, and and I, I happen to have puppets that are related to the the book that I read. Um, a huge Paul Mesner fan, and I happened upon uh, the puppet show that he did uh, for these books. So it was it was a great great experience. But yeah, thank thank you for sharing, Jody. Yeah, because I read to the school too, 
But I think when the kids found out that I had a nephew that played in the NFL, I think they were more interested in that than oh, the story. Well, it <laughs> could have been. Could have been. I, I, I got to have a little hook somewhere, right? That's awesome. So, well, thank you all for sharing. I appreciate it. Um, okay, so we're going to go on and uh, approve the agenda for the April 1st, 2024 regular Board of Education meeting as published, and I will entertain a motion. I think we're amending it, but so I'll move to amend it. it the suggested motion amends it, doesn't it? Right. So you read the motion. Right. I move that the Board of Education amend the agenda as published for the April 1st, 2024 regular Board of Education meeting as follows. One, move consent agenda item E, contract with KC Architects LLC to new business agenda item D. Delete consent agenda item L, National School, School Boards Association membership for 2024-25. And add new business agenda item E, student discipline appeal officers. I have a motion by Gina. Second? Second. Second by Patrick. Any discussion? I can, I can, <clears throat> sorry. I just, there's a Amplify contract as well. I'd, I'd like to pull that and add it to new business just so we can have a discussion on it. Okay, so. I will amend, I can amend my. It, do we just that? need to, do we need to amend Gina's? Okay. 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 Perfect. So it stands as read. Uh, I have one comment. Um, the NSBA uh, membership is being pulled off because the invoice did not come in in time uh, to add it to this meeting. So that's why it's being pulled off. It will be back on next month. All right. Um, all in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. Okay, on the consent agenda. So we, yeah. we, we just proved the, the, yeah. So now we're on to the consent. Oh, okay. Thank you. Second. Great. Motion by Patrick, second by Gina. Any discussion? What are we approving? The amended agenda. The amended agenda. What did we just vote for? Two amendments. Okay. I know. I, there's, there's a dial. That, okay. Uh, all in favor, all um, opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. Seven zero to amend. Okay, so now we move on consent. to the consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Yeah, so just the Amplify contract. Yes. Okay. As amended. Okay, and we have a second. Motion by Patrick, second by Sonia. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. All right. Okay. On to new business. Business. First up uh, this evening is a presentation uh, that Dr. Schmidt is going to lead. Uh, last month we talked um, about a couple of specific programs and um, there were some questions about uh, special education numbers and where they were coming from and so we just thought it might be it, would, it was time for us to kind of come back and, and present to you special education kind of by the numbers and where we're standing in the district. So Dr. Schmidt, I turn it to you. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me to do this tonight. Uh, spoiler alert, there is no ask at the end of this. So I'm not gonna ask for any additional funding or anything else. But I did want to, you know, I, I do appreciate being able to share with you kind of some of the challenges and some of the, uh, what all is incorporated into special education. Um, the first thing I'd, I would 
want to talk about is just the scope. Uh, public school districts are required to serve students with disabilities starting at age three, well before kindergarten, all the way to uh, when students turn 21. The year they turn 21 at the end of that year is when they run out of eligibility. And something that I'm very proud of is, is special education has a zero reject policy. And what I mean by that is we take all comers. You know, if you have a student that lives within your boundaries or that is eligible to be in your school, there's not a reason based on disability that they, they're not entitled to have services to make sure they're making progress in the general ed curriculum and also on their special ed goals. Um, when we start talking about, yeah. So we're required to, to provide services for kids three through 21. Have they graduated by the time they reach 21 or is that a different program? No, so um, when students finish their high school requirements through special education, oftentimes that's around age 18. Okay. Uh, they do not accept their diploma. Once a student would accept the diploma, then they no longer have eligibility within the public schools. And so what students will do is oftentimes they will walk with their peers at graduation. However, they do not accept the, the diploma and they continue on with transition goals within the 18 to 21 year old program that I'll discuss a little bit more later on. Thank you, Mark. What percent of special ed students actually end up getting a diploma or graduating? So Kansas is one of the uh, state, state education processes that do, does not have a separate uh, diploma for students with special needs. There is one diploma that you earn whether, whether you receive special education services or not. And so um, the dropout rate is very, very low. It, it's very comparable to what, in Blue Valley, very comparable to what it is for the general ed population. And I, and I take pride in that because, you know, that's an indication that we are meeting kids' needs and helping them advance in the general ed curriculum. Um, you know, we, we talk about how special ed is growing. And so this gives a little bit gr greater breakdown of that. This year we have 2,939 students with disabilities. And that includes all disabilities, whether it's a student that only needs a, a, some speech services to students that are greatly impacted by autism or by multiple disabilities um, or intellectual disabilities. So, we, we have a wide breadth of services that are needed by kids. Um, within special ed law, we have to identify what is a primary disability. And there are 13 different categories of disability. Plus, in Kansas, gifted is also part of special ed, so that's the 14th category. Um, in our district, we have 13, 1,338 students uh, who are identified as gifted. And then 55 of that number are twice exceptional. In other words, there's a disability that goes along with the giftedness. And so we need to serve both students that, are, that have the giftedness and, and need that extra challenge, but also accommodate those disabilities. Uh, within our district over the last three years, we have grown 16.8% in three years. That, that really becomes important when you consider that the, the funding for all students, our all student growth is where we get our funding, and it has only grown by 1%. So, so that gives you an idea. And, I, and you might ask, why is that happening? Part of it is a lot of students now need more speech services, whether that's through the pandemic or any other. We're also doing a better job of identifying students through our reading intervention programs. That, that are making a huge, huge step. Uh, the structured literacy that we now use uh, in our district has really made it uh, very positive steps in meeting kids' needs in general ed, but also identifying those students that need additional services. Growth, the greatest areas of growth is uh, deaf and hard of hearing. And now 41% looks a little om ominous, but if you look at the actual number of students that's going from 12 students to 17 students. And so it's a large percentage, but not a large number. 
Uh, speech has also really skyrocketed. Uh, LD, uh, which would be a lot of the students with a reading disability, has also gone up, and you can see the rest uh, on there. So how do we compare to other districts? Are we now over-identifying students? Because we've grown 16 plus percent, general population's only grown 1 percent, are we just doing more of that? And I would say no. Uh, as you can see here, I did a heat map for each one of the uh, learning disabilities and did a comparison of our district to Spring Hill, Gardner, DeSoto, Olathe, et cetera, and also compared to the state. As you can see, uh, the red would indicate that we are higher than the state, and then green would be we're less than the state. So in aut with autism, deafblind, and giftedness, we're well above the state average. For the others, we're either right at state average or below the state average uh, in comparison to other districts. So that gives you a little bit of a picture of the population of our students with disabilities is a little bit different than maybe uh, with the state from a whole or even some of our neighboring districts. Any questions on this? Yes. Is the dyslexia um, focus over the last like five or so years, however many it's been now, um, pushing that learning disability number up? Do we identify dyslexia separately or more often now? So, so the state passed a law a year ago that asked us to create a new category, not just us, but the state of Kansas, uh, dyslexia as an area of disability. And dyslexia has always been an area of disability, but it's, it's umbrellaed under uh, learning disabilities, okay? So what we need to do now is if a student has a learn, is identified with a learning disability as their primary exceptionality, then we determine whether or not that, that learning disability is due to dyslexia. And so it, it hasn't necessarily increased the number just because of the new law, but I would say that we're doing a better job of identifying students that actually have that disability um, and, and need specialized instruction. Patrick. They're just simply the numbers in every school. The, these numbers, no, these are the percentage of the population, for example, in Blue Valley, 1.5% of our total population has been identified for special education with a primary exceptionality of autism. Right, it's just based on the number of kids. Student population. Number of kids in the schools that have those um, disabilities, right? Yeah, it's a percentage right. Yeah, for each district. So if we're a large district, 1.5% of course is far more students than if you were in Spring Hill. Right. Uh, okay. <clears throat> what falls underneath other health impaired? So other health impaired is a little bit of a catch-all that could be uh, any kind of a medical condition. For example, uh, some students with, um, who have attention deficit and require, inc uh, require additional support, require specialized instruction, would fall under other health impaired because it's a medical condition that doesn't fall under one of the other categories. Patrick. So if you were to, I mean, the, the, the answer is no. If Blue Valley was the state average of 15.97%, we have identified 35, 92 students with disabilities. Is there a particular environment that we're creating that is impacting that? Um, I would say it's not Blue Valley necessarily. Well, um, I, I do believe that we have a pretty good reputation working with kids with disabilities. And um, over the years, I've, I've met many, many parents who have kids uh, that, who have disabilities, and they've told me that they moved to Blue Valley for those services. Um, I think that is the exact same as parents who move their kids to Blue Valley without disabilities because they want an exceptional education. And if you happen to have a child with disabilities, don't you want to go where you feel that they're going to get the best 
services available. And so I think we do have some attraction. I think that you know we're going to we see some of that attraction with the new open boundaries, and we, we've been hearing about that quite a bit. And and I can talk about that a little bit more later on. But uh, that is something that uh, uh, keeps me up at night uh, because you know we we're struggling with staffing now. Uh, we're, we we're ahead of the game from where we were last year, but. I know that you know if we have an influx at the last minute, it's going to be very difficult to, to find highly qualified staff members to serve the needs of kids. Yes, that was going to be my question. How do you foresee that impacting your numbers right now with open open enrollment? Well, um, depending on how open enrollment it is and what buildings that those that that is in, will make that determination. So. Um, you know, if I, I think that we have many parents and we've been contacted by many parents who have expressed their desire to apply. Now, I don't know how that's going to come out in the lottery or, you know, the other policy. And I think there's some unknowns yet that the board still has to consider about what do we declare uh, an open or closed program. And so it, it, it's a little bit premature for me to you know, launch into that. I don't know, Dr. Merrigan? I think that we're having a presentation just a little bit that you can ask some of those questions. But honestly, uh, there we can sit here and predict all we want until it actually happens. We aren't going to know. Yeah. Can I, <clears throat> quick question. So this morning we were talking about transportation, mm -hmm. you know, and issues surrounding that and, and all. Um, do I remember correctly that approximately 40% of the transportation in Blue Valley is for those with special needs? That, that would be correct. And so a student, a student related, or um, one of the requirements of IDEA is that we provide whatever related services are necessary for a student to benefit from their special education services, okay? So for students that uh, can't access their student, their services uh, because they can't get to school, then we would have, then we're required to provide that transportation. Another area is if we have a student that's being educated outside their home neighborhood, uh, which would happen with our center-based programs that I'll talk about in a minute here, uh, we are required to provide transportation because there's not a general ed transportation option for them. Uh, in addition, we provide transportation for all of our early childhood students because if you're three to five years old, you probably don't want them walking among, you know, along the street there. Uh, that's what Jan told me anyway. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, so yes, we have a lot of students that receive transportation, um, but it's also something that I think we want to revisit as a special ed team to make sure that. We're identifying the students that need transportation on their IEP, but we're also making sure we're not, you know, offering it when it's not required. So I might suggest that Mark continue his presentation because I think some of these questions will be answered as we go. Okay, so um, within special education, we always talk about uh, students with disabilities are general education students first. And that's really highlighted when 72% of our students spend 80% of or greater of their time in general education classes. And only a very small number, 6.5%, spend 40% or less of their time in general education. And this is important because the primary, one of the primary purposes of special education is to make sure that students make progress in the general ed curriculum. And so we always have to think about you know, whatever changes we make in general ed, special ed needs to come back behind and say, okay, what is it going to take to make progress in this general ed curriculum? Well, to make that happen, we have a continuum of services. Uh, some, some of our least, and we always have to make sure that kids are in the least restrictive environment. In other words, what's the environment closest to their peers? Uh, for example, speech only. We have 320 students that only receive speech services. And really, kids only miss uh, general ed class about uh, 20 minutes twice a week, 
20 minutes three times a week in general. Uh, they have the therapy, and then off they go back to class. And that's available in all of our schools. Gifted education is another one, uh, 1338 students. And students, uh, we're one of eight, eight states that has that as part of special education. I think I mentioned that before. But really, students are in general ed classes all but one period a day, generally. And I have to say generally, because in special education, it's based on individual needs of students. Um, then we have in, uh, interrelated resource room. And interrelated means that we have a wide variety of disabilities that are within the room. But these are kids that the general ed curriculum is the most appropriate for them. They can be successful in their general ed classes. They just need some accommodations or uh, a little bit of specialized instruction, typically one, one period a day, to make, that, to make that work for them. And once again, that's 1680 number of students that we have right now. Uh, we have the social emotional resource room. Uh, and we have 96 students, and these are students that uh, struggle maybe with self-regulation. Uh, they have uh, uh, trauma in their background, and, and sometimes that results in some behaviors that interfere with their learning or others' learning. And, you know, with, with that, it could be probably one or two classrooms or uh, periods a day in the SER classroom, but most of it is accommodations and then breaks as needed so that we can regain uh, self-regulation. Next, we have navigators, also a high incidence program, which means that high incidence means that you're in the general leg curriculum. And while you don't have to have autism, this, the kids that are in the program tend to have some autism, but they're also very capable of um, being successful in general education. Uh, we talked about the 55 kids that are twice exceptional, gifted, and uh, uh, have a disability. Navigators oftentimes has the students in that position. They need some help with social skills. They need some help on how do they access, how do they ask help, how do they appropriately respond in social situations and so forth. And so uh, once again, it's very limited amount of time in the special education classroom, but there, are, there is a need for accommodations. Intensive resource. Now, intensive resource would what, was what the state refers to as a low incidence program. Uh, students often need an uh, expanded curriculum or a alternate curriculum or might need uh, modified grades, assignments. And there are 271 students within our district that fall within this program. You don't have to have an intellectual or you don't have to have intellectual disability as your primary exceptionality, but it is very common, okay? Uh, learning through uh, intensive functional teaching, and I put that in there because people always ask me, what does LIFT stand for? And I can never come up with it at the last minute. So I spelled it out so I didn't get stuck here today. Uh, also a low incidence program, and this would be mostly students that are diagnosed with autism or sometimes with other health impaired uh, that have a disability um, that really impacts their ability to, to function within a general ed curriculum. Uh, sometimes some, be, you know, some behaviors get in the way. Uh, communication is a big skill that's often missing and that the lack of communication often causes some of the behaviors that we see as disruptive. Um, and you can see we have the, those programs in a number of different elementary, middle, and high schools. Yeah, let's see. Next. Uh, next, we needed to add on the, the bookends of our program, the Early Childhood Center. And right now, we have 320 students in, within Blue Valley that are within our classrooms. Plus, we have 82 students with disabilities that receive itinerant service, so they just come in for say speech or OT services or PT services, another 94 in evaluation. And uh, I want to just touch base on that. In, in early childhood, it's, it's a specialized program because we need to make sure we evaluate kids by the time they turn three. That means from the beginning of the year, 
to the end of the year, we grow greatly because, you know, kids turn three all year long. And so the minute they turn three, they're eligible to come. And so right now, uh, Kendall would tell me that Kendall Burr, who, who of course is our director, uh, tells me that they are, they are making great progress and expect another 94 students or thereabouts to come on in. And we educate our students with disability alongside peers. And we have 195 peers that are also in the program that come for half day, either in the morning or the afternoon. And then, of course, our 18 to 21 year old program, 60 students uh, that are in this program, three year program. And they're receiving the majority of their uh, programming off campus in a community setting, working, working on job skills, uh, looking at whatever is needed for what's next in their lives. You know, we're working tremendously towards uh, independence. And whatever independence means, that could mean learning how to do self care. That could mean paid employment. And we're working on those goals based on an individual nature. Related services, I talked about this earlier, a wide variety of related services. And these are the things that are necessary for a student to make progress in the general ed curriculum. Uh, some kids need assistive technology. We, we provide that, audiology, uh, vision, nursing care. I think right now we have 16 students that have full-time nurses. That are, that are working just with them. Um, transportation is listed there, hearing, um, behavior intervention, speech language, social work, the whole variety. And here's, here's the kicker. I listed these out. This is not a total list. If a student needs it and it's required to make progress, we need to figure out how to do it. And, and that's what the state guidelines say as well. Okay, so we're having this growth of six, over 16%. What, how about, you know, how are we doing with uh, the growth of our teacher population? Uh, so I kind of lined it out there, what the number of SPED teachers we've had on the disability side, gifted side, related service providers, and then classified staff. And you can see that, you know, over three years we've grown 8%. Last year we, we kept up with our student population growth. Um, but over three years, we're a little bit behind. Um, one of the questions I anticipated is why, why didn't we keep up, right? And there, there's a couple reasons for that. One is that we really were working hard on the salary schedule across the district to make sure that we can be competitive with some of our neighbors. But the second one, and more importantly, right now there's a shortage of teachers. And do you have to make the decision? Do you open up a position that you're pretty sure you're not going to be able to fill and then have to you know, have a group of kids that have a long-term sub that doesn't have a background in special education serving in that role? And so over the last few years, we've had to make some um, tough administrative decisions to say, hey, we're not going to add this year, but we need to think about what we're going to do next year. Um, and, and so right now, like for next year, we've added two lift classrooms at the elementary level because caseloads were growing significantly. I believe we're going to be able to fill all, all of those positions. Uh, we're in really good shape right now. Um, and so we, we just look and add and try to make sure we can do two things. One, fill the positions that we ask for and also remain very competitive uh, with our neighbors. Anything else? Any questions? What questions do you have? Yeah, Patrick. So it's a great presentation. I'm a big fan of the program, particularly the 18 to 21. I certainly think you're making a big difference in many kids' lives, obviously starting from age 3 to 21. You went through a number of categories there of different uh, environments that we have available for our kids. I was looking at the number of schools and which where the programs are at. I think you said you had a number of kids that might have multiple learning environment needs. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that that's a, a pretty big lift to try and coordinate all of those different schools with the various environments that are needed for where the kids are at. How do you do that? Um, I have a very good team. And when I say team, that's, that's not just people that wear a special ed hat. That's our general ed 
population as, as well. Um, Jake gets phone calls from me on a regular basis saying, hey, guess what? We're adding a specialized program in this building um, and we need X, Y, Z. And Jake, I don't think you've yet told me you can't do it. Um, we've, we've had some situations where we had safety concerns that just recently came up that we needed some, some padding floor. Jake's on it, you know, to, to help us there. Uh, I work with a, a group of building principals that are very student focused, very student first. And generally they don't say, no, you can't come in here. They say, okay, how do we make this happen? How do we make this happen so it's done well? And um, when you have that kind of collaboration, uh, it doesn't make it easy, but it makes it doable. And that's, that's kind of how we put this together. I've been doing this now for 14 years in the district. Um, and, and I really do have a lot of pride in, in what we provide kids. Uh, and meeting the needs of the kids. And I also have that same pride in the special ed staff and the other professionals that I work with, including the general ed teachers that, as I discussed, are a huge part of the success of kids uh, for kids with disabilities. So, um, you, ad you address this here. I, I think I just want to um, make sure I understand. So from a, from a budget perspective, um, put aside salary increases, we've, we've had experienced more growth in the number of students being served than staff, which either suggests that the staff are, are um, either the staff had capacity that, that the growth took up or some of the staff are over capacity. Um, and yeah. I'm wondering which it is. Both. So um, within special education, one of the, one of the levers that we do, we do have is once the IEP team determines what services the students need, administratively we can determine the location of those services. But going back to the idea of um, uh, least restrictive. Least restrictive is when the services take place in your building, but if they're not available there, trying to find a building this close by. Um, we, we probably have stretched our capacity. Uh, caseloads have gone up over the years, uh, but then that's why, like I mentioned, the lift program, the caseloads were to a point where we weren't comfortable with where they were at. I, I talked to superintendent's cabinet, uh, explained why we needed what we did, and we were able to add to that, uh, along with uh, uh, quite a few other positions that are in need. And just like in general education, when, when we kind of get to that point where we, we have to make a decision to say, okay, are we gonna add a staff member? Do we think we can fill that staff position? And then also, where's it gonna be? Because we we no longer have room in every elementary school to add another classroom, another special ed teacher uh, in, into various places. And so then that puts us into a dilemma of, do we add another special ed program to a building that has a small general ed population but already has two or even three specialized programs? And so that, that's some of the juggling we have to do and it requires a lot of conversation uh, most like mostly face to face or at least on the phone to kind of figure out where that where that goes. I, I don't know if one, that answered my question. One of the biggest issues is staff, though, is finding staff. And um, I know that uh, Dr. Punzelk and his team, Dr. Schmidt and his team, are all recruiting all the time. And I would say, uh, no matter if it's the first day of school or the last day of school, if they find a special education teacher, they're offering a contract. Uh, and you did approve a couple on tonight's uh, consent agenda for some of the new positions yeah. that you um, mentioned. Yeah, actually, thanks for mentioning HR. Uh, I think I kind of live over in the HR world a little bit um, in just trying to, once we get an offer made, uh, Steve is fantastic about 
calling them in and, and getting an offer in front of the staff member just as quickly as we can. And so, you know, shout out to HR for how aggressive they are and making sure that we don't get beat to the punch by any other neighboring districts. So one other question. Um, the, going back to your slide where you showed the growth um, in numbers versus a flat enrollment or so in the district yeah. generally, um, is, the, is the underlying, my underlying assumption is, is that most of that growth is students that were already here and not that it was like a replenishment where you had some from who weren't in the district before that were seeking out special ed services or is it a blend? Can you, especially I'm interested in the, the most intensive um, special needs students, which are you know, the ones that are the most costly on a per pupil basis and, and maybe the, the least reimbursed by our state. So when, when we're talking about students that are served in the low incidence programs, um, you're really talking about students that either have moved in or they moved in before kindergarten because of the educational programming. You're, you're, you're not talking about a student that you know, is on the, on the edge of do they qualify for special education or not when you have that significant of a disability. So you're really talking about move-ins and then people that chose our district because of the special ed services. Um, for students that are, say, in the learning disability or speech category, we're probably, we're probably doing a better job of identifying students or our student needs have come up um, because of recent years um, that we've needed to address. So it's kind of depending on, you know, the, 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 category. the category, yeah. So because we're understaffed and I assume that most of those staffing are in more of that IRR um, classroom that's, you know, the study skills in the middle and high school level, mm -hmm that serves those kids that are in the middle of our educational mm -hmm. system, right? And um, so how has that affected how we are meeting IEP goals? Are we seeing that they're meeting fewer, their goals less often since they don't have, I mean, those are often, there's often disparate needs in those classes. Mm -hmm. You don't have um, specialized, I mean, they'll push in, but um, you don't have the specialized focus all day like you do with the lift and all these other ones but um, are, are we seeing fewer IP goals met or we're no. lower no we're, we're seeing we're seeing um, IP goals are being met um, in, in general yeah you know we certainly have some situations where the IEP team decides that we're going to whatever goals are going to be work and then during the year the students don't meet those goals and then we need to look at services increasing services and so forth. Um, our special ed teachers and our related service providers are incredible. Um, they, uh, for example, you know, at the elementary level, and I, and I could say the same thing about middle and high school, but you know, they're working with teachers any minute that they're not working with students. And so all of that paperwork, everything that, that goes along with special education, they're doing after school. And, and I worry about that, you know? Um, but they are putting kids first, and I admire that about them, but I also know that we have to find a way to relieve some of that. Um, so because we're, I mean, we've, we're unable to find teachers, special ed teachers, um, are we, and then we're not, on pace, I guess, if, if you would say, with the state increase, are we under-identifying special ed? I don't think so. Um, you know. Especially learning disability yeah. and other impairments. No, I think, we're, I think we're looking at that. And with MTSS that we're implementing right now and develop in making sure that we have reading instruction, especially at the elementary level, 
uh, using structured literacy, the 95% group that um, our curriculum department has put into place. I, I think, you know, that, that is one of the biggest gains for both general ed and special education. And we're able to meet those needs there so that, you know, it used to be that special ed was the only game in town. And so if you had a student that, that wasn't learning fast enough, well, they must be in special education. We're now to the point where we can do research-based, effective intervention through general ed to make sure that a student, before we identify a student in special education. So I really don't think we're under-identifying uh, in uh, LD or any of our categories. I think that there's a process that we have to follow to make sure that we're serving kids. Mark, from a staffing standpoint, I'll assume that some special needs students require um, a higher ratio of teachers to students and some... Absolutely. Uh, and what would be interesting from my viewpoint would be to see numbers, I mean, the percentages, you know, like you showed 41.7, but there's only 12. I mean, that doesn't really tell me anything, but it would be interesting at some point to see what our target student population would be, and then what is our ratio of teachers to students in each of those classifications? Now, there, there's some exceptions to this, okay? But so for an IRR teacher in general, you know, at the elementary level, we try to keep the caseloads at the beginning of the year 15 or below, okay? Because we know kids are gonna be added throughout the year. At the middle school and high school, when we traditionally don't add as many students throughout the year, I, I'm looking at 18. Uh, 18 is kind of the target. That doesn't mean cutoff, that means target. Uh, lift, you know, seven or eight. It used to be six, but it's seven or eight now, and we were creeping closer to eight, nine, and even 10. And that's why we added the additional staff. Um, but you have to make those decisions early because you have to recruit staff, you have to open up a classroom, you have to do the facility work to prepare for that. And that's what we're trying to get ahead of right now. Does that answer your question? Well, I'd like to at some point see a full breakdown. Oh yeah, sure, I can throughout do everything. Yeah, I can. But yeah, you answered my question and it just tells me we need to be able to take a look at each individual, not with, you're painting with a broad brush tonight, so we're familiar Absolutely. with it. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Mark, does the, the um, for those with dyslexia and related learning disabilities, I'm thinking specifically of dyslexia, so is, are those reading specialists that are covered under the special ed budget? No, reading, the reading specialists are out of general ed, and that would be part of the uh, MTSS. That's part of the, the program that we, we utilize prior to students be identified with a learning disability and then being served within um, under IDEA. So, you know, so often we, we look at kids, you know, have they been, have they received instruction with research-based interventions? And with our reading specialists, we can, we can be assured that kids have had instruction with research-based interventions. Our special ed teachers are trained um, yes. to give those reading services to the students. So it doesn't have to be the reading specialist because our special ed teacher is the one who's trained to give that specialized instruction. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, all of our IRR teachers have gone through extensive training um, not just what every teacher is required to do, but uh, three full days plus three additional observations by a trainer to make sure that we are uh, doing, doing the structured literacy instruction with fidelity. So, so just uh, this topic came up when we were in our SEAC meeting. Um, this, this sometimes is, I'm not, not clear whether this is falling under general ed or under special ed, but if we, if we think about the growth and incidence of people, I'm just thinking about dyslexia, but um, who um, have, you know, reading challenges, may or may not qualify for special ed services, and pretty good, robust set of 
ability to identify it and deal with it at the elementary level, do we think there are gaps at the middle and high school level, either on the general ed side or special ed side, that we're not addressing? So that's the whole screening that we do three times a year, if I'm looking at my friends over here, three times a year if it's needed for every new student. So that's how we are identifying those students and providing those interventions for those students. So do I think in the past I would have said absolutely yes. Now I think that we are catching more and more of those because even as a student new walks in the door at middle and high school, we're screening them to see where they're at. And working, Jennifer and Kelly and the curriculum team are working with our buildings to provide those intervention, research-based interventions at middle and high schools. So I believe, Tanya, correct me if I'm wrong here, they're also screening the current students and we'll move them into the reading strategies classroom. Correct, correct, absolutely. Mid-semester if they need the additional help. Yes. I just meant we weren't missing new people as they came in in the middle of a year. And and so and do we feel like we have good staffing to address those that need the help? Um, I feel like we're working towards that. I think that it's providing the professional learning to the staff that we have so that they have the skills to do that. Do I think we're 100% there yet? I would say no, we're not. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. So this is a related question to Jim's. So um, while the legislature is yet to fully fund special education and we're still working on that, we hope that they can make progress this year. How are we compared to our uh, regional districts as it relates to recruiting and the programs that we have? Now, I understand that you can say, gee, our programs are growing faster and we've got more students uh, from a growth standpoint than some of the other districts. But overall, how are we doing compared to the other districts? And you know, some of them have a few less and some have a few more, but overall, there's still a pretty large population throughout the county. And so in terms of teacher retention or attraction and in terms of effectiveness of the programs, how do they stand up against our uh, sister uh, districts? Yeah, um, while I don't have the exact numbers, of course, from from our neighbors, I, I would say that we're very competitive, you know, as far as recruitment and retention. Um, we let, every year we gain some new friends from next door, uh, next doors. Um, and e- each year we have some teachers that seek out employment in one of our neighbors. And so um, there's, there's a healthy competition, friendly competition uh, for staff members, but I would say my discussions with my peers in the other other districts is everybody is struggling on the staffing side. Everyone is uh, struggling with student growth that that uh, within special education that's not that's not getting the funding from the state that we require, uh, which is requiring the general ed budget to fund a greater and greater extent of of the services that we have to provide. So and this may be a more difficult question, but how do we compare in terms of our, with, with the resources that we're given and, and the teachers that we're able to attract, how do we compare from uh, the standpoint of, and, and this may have to do with class size, right? I mean, mm-hmm. if it should be six and sometimes we're at 10, in comparison to our other district, how are we doing as it relates to the progress or the development of each child in our program? Um, I don't know how to address that from our neighbor districts. I, I can tell you that within Blue Valley, we're meeting the goals on the special education um, IEPs. Mm-hmm. Uh, our kids are graduating. Um, we have students that are finding success uh, after, after after they leave us. Um, we, we meet all of the requirements to be fully accredited by KSDE uh, under special education. Um, So yeah, I I have a hard time comparing it to the others, but I think we would stack up quite well. Okay, thank you. 
All right. If no one has any questions, our captioner does need a five-minute break. So as does the presenter. As does the presenter. You were kind of looking a little sweaty up there. So um, yeah. So uh, five minutes, and then we'll come back to it. Thanks.
All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with the last little bit here. <clears throat> I think our captioner's rested. Um, did we finish up with... Uh... Okay, Mark says that we were done. <laughs> Fantastic. I felt as though we were, but... And, and thank you for that presentation. It was very informative. Um, on to the 2025-2026 calendar. So Dr. Collier is going to come up and present the 2526 calendar. Um, I would note that we have been talking about some professional learning days for staff. We're still in ongoing discussions with that. And so all we're going to do this evening is, is to present a calendar, start date, end date, you know, breaks in there, uh, et cetera. But it is our intent um, to come back with and uh, add some professional days for our teaching staff uh, in the very near future for your consideration. So with that, I'll turn it to Dr. Collier. Yes, this is the calendar that you've previously seen um, at our public session in February and workshop again in March. Um, we have not changed any of the content um, of the calendar since you last saw it, um, with the exception of adding on that date as requested um, by a board member that we have identified seniors last day um, as May 15th, and that's uh, class day. And so we have added that. Um, we uh, will be publicizing this calendar um, on the district website for parents to access and staff to access that. As a reminder, this calendar is developed through a committee, representative committee of staff members, and it has been put out for both staff and parent input. Um, so again, no changes from the last time that we've, that we've discussed the calendar. Happy to answer any questions. Quick question for you. So your nice little box down here that talks about the five uh, emergency days, all that. <clears throat> because as a parent, I would calculate it myself, right? Does there need to be a line that just says the last day will be announced by the superintendent? Or, or do you know what I'm saying? We could, we could uh, make a statement that that final last day is, all, is communicated second semester by the superintendent. I just or wonder if that might We can add a statement before because posting. I might, as a parent, honestly be like, oh, well, we didn't have any of sure. these, so I'm going to assume it's this date. I'm going to book my plans or camp or whatever and sure we can add that that's not a problem can we have a problem with that great thank you mm -hmm. all right so uh, if there's no other if there are no other questions I'll entertain a motion Jim would you like to make the motion okay sure. I don't want to flub it I want to make sure you're paying attention. I am. I move that the Board of Education approve the 2025-2026 district calendar as presented. Second. Motion by Jim, second by Gina. Any discussion? I got one quick question. Okay. So the end of the semester is on May 22nd. How is that different than the last day of school? It isn't. It's the same. Okay. It's the last day of the second semester, which is the last day of school. Okay, so that's really already on there then, right? Calendar. Right. Okay. I, I don't think it's any different than before. If, if there's snow days or... They could change it. Um, there, that's their little cap, the little caveat is that if, cause if we were to have, and even now when we put communication out, it's always foreseeing no future um, issues. So say we had some crazy weather that knocked out power and we were out of school for a week, we'd have to add a week. Yeah, I just think maybe that notation at the end may cause some confusion if you have May 22nd, the last end of semester, and then you say, well, the superintendent's going to announce the last day at some mm -hmm. point in time. So you, you may have to go into more description. Okay. It's, it's been this way for a long, long time, but we can certainly change it if you think it's confusing. No, 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 my reference to... To my... To, to what Jody added? That. It may yeah. create some it, more confusion. I, I just, I want it to be very clear, and I I think the way I would, like I said, I would calculate it on, on my own. I, but I know, because I've been around a long time, that the superintendent's the one that calls the last day. So I just want it to be very clear that that's the person who calls the last day. And we usually do it after spring break. One, one thing I would note in the working through the development of ca calendar coding and statements, et cetera, we try to be as precise 
um, and as concise as possible in our quoting and our statements because it is interpreted by so many individuals. So we do see, seek to, that is one of our goals, obviously, when we work to code code the calendar, so. So Patrick, if you think that it's, it, 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 my suggestion is, is not necessary or creates confusion, I'm fine with that, but. Yeah, I, I would just say that you'd probably need something along the lines of, you know, the last day of school is the end of semester on May 22nd. However, in the event there's a tentative, variety. you're talking about a tentative last day, right? Something like that. I mean, that's all. I just I'll leave it up to you. Notice that. Don't care. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, let's see here. We've got the motion. Yep. We'll need to vote, right? So moved. you moved. We've discussed. All in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. All right, next, the uh, non-resident student enrollment for 2024-2025. Okay, it's the PowerPoint, not this PDF. That document I will reference here in a little bit, though. Okay, so Dr. Punswick here has joined me. Um, a lot of the information that you're uh, going to hear tonight and see is, is very similar to what we've kind of done through the course of the last year to get to this point, um, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, first of all, this new policy we created, 3122, was around non-resident students in response to new legislation, so Kansas law uh, is requiring uh, districts to accept non-resident students, so there's a whole uh, uh, process we've gone through to get us to the point to where we're going to publish uh, open seats. So this is the next step, Honorable Form May 1st. Uh, we have to present uh, the recommendations concerning our capacity, the people-to-teacher ratios are, are taken into consideration, and then the board has to approve of what we have presented or amend uh, what we have presented. Uh, just a reminder, the capacity for our schools was presented in February. Uh, Eric Pollum was here uh, to share that information with you. That was the report that they popped up there. We actually we attached that to this um, agenda so you would uh, be able to see that or the public could see that also. Number of students expected to attend each school in the school district was also in that report. Um, not only for this year, uh, but for next year and the four years after that. Um, and then today we're going to talk about the number of open seats uh, that are available for this next coming school year. So part of determining capacity, obviously, our PTR uh, comes into play. Um, we're going to talk about that uh, briefly here in a little bit. Um, we do take into consideration all the projected enrollment shifts and all the different um, factors that are happening uh, around our community when it comes to community growth. Um, and then just the demand for courses. Uh, we've gone through enrollment at our, at our, high, <clears throat> at our high schools already. Excuse me. So uh, we have kind of an, a, a really good sense of, of what uh, um, uh, students are, are interested in and what they're going to enroll in. And then we also take into consideration our capacity of our classroom activity and then also our common spaces, uh, which is um, really important to, to keep in mind. So as a reminder, we have additional qualifications that we established um, in high school. Um, the first indication is that the capacity within the entire school stays below 75%. 
uh, for that five-year duration, um, and the only school um, that qualifies at this point in time is Blue Valley Southwest, and they are uh, just below that 75% threshold at this uh, present time. Um, the other thing that we do take into consideration before uh, even beyond the 75% for our high schools is just what that looks like per grade level and uh, per class uh, when it comes to the offerings and the impact that they, that may have when it comes to our human resources department and trying to find uh, people to pos uh, fill positions. In our K-8, so our elementary and our middle schools, um, once again, that 75% uh, uh, threshold is, is in place. Uh, beyond that, we go down to the classroom level and also uh, do uh, a calculation for uh, each of our, our schools to see if, if uh, what that number would be that would allow for that ceiling to, to be reached. So the only school available and open right now would be Aspen Grove Elementary. Um, and we'll go through what grade levels uh, we are uh, recommending at this point in time. Hey, Kyle. So if, if a child transfers to Southwest from another school, Where's Keisha on all this? So the current current Keisha guidelines are if you enter as a ninth grader, you could have immediate eligibility uh, regardless of whether it's varsity or not. Um, uh, if you are 10th, 11th, or 12th grader, uh, you would have to sit out for a year. Thank you. For varsity competition. You're eligible for uh, sub-varsity. Uh, the priority in filling open seats, this is a reminder, um, here's just, the, I'm not going to read through all these bullets, but um, these are the bullets that is required by statute uh, that we uh, adhere to, so um, some of the things uh, we already adhere to, so it's really nothing uh, that's, a, that's much of a change for us. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, student as a parent or a person acting as a parent? So you, we're not even saying guardian, we're just... Correct, because it could, it could be a grandparent, and they may not have adopted the children. Um, yeah, so it, they it, don't have They don't have the ability. The state it's the language. Oh, it's the language the state uses. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Punswick here. He's going to talk about the PTR, um, but he's also going to go into the, the, uh, what we have at each grade level for Aspen Grove and then also for Blue Valley Southwest. All right, uh, this chart is familiar. Um, it is what we use for people to teacher ratios, and we use this for staffing on an annual basis, and the board has approved these numbers. If you look at Aspen Grove Elementary, um, we put a chart together that identifies what we currently have um, staffed for next year. We look at what the 75% grade level capacity is, subtract one student from that so that we don't go over. We have a projected enrollment that you'll see there. This is from where we see um, students returning, um, our projections from some of the new housing starts that occurred, and people that have uh, signified that they are going to be enrolling. So you'll see 140 students on a projected enrollment. And if you take the 75% capacity above that line, you'll see that our non-resident seats then are sitting um, right at 46 for the entire building. And I, we want to draw a, a little bit of an um, indicator here under fourth and fifth grade that we don't have any um, seats available there uh, because of our feeder pattern. So we're going to be going into Aubrey Bend. The new middle school is not going to be completed in time um, for us to put more students in four and five because we'll be above capacity that at Aubrey Bend. But we do have that ability in K through three, knowing that the new middle school will be online by the time those third graders are going into sixth grade. So these are the projected enrollments with and uh, without, and this is what we're being published, that these are the available seats that we know of right now um, from K to three at Aspen Grove. We do a similar model at the high school, but we're looking at it from a grade level perspective. So we have a very large uh, freshman class coming in in comparison to um, what's currently in the building from sophomore to senior. That's a great thing. 286 students that are gonna be coming here next year that we know are enrolled and ready to go. Um, that number it sits above that 270 threshold that we look at from our current staffing that we have in that building. Um, so no freshman seats available uh, next year. 
However, we do have uh, availability in 10th and 11th and 12th because those are smaller classes. So a total of 40 students that are um, uh, available, uh, 40 seats for students to apply to, uh, bringing our total up to uh, 1,096 total students that we have capacity for, given our current staffing um, for that building. You will notice that that building is um, sized to the paint point that we can add additional students uh, beyond these numbers, but to do that, we also have to find staffing uh, to be able to do that. That's why we feel that at this um, this number right here, this fits with when, what we currently have staff, and we can, we can support that moving forward. All right, yes. Good question. So remind me of the timeline here. So if I want to apply mm -hmm. my child to, to come to the school, when do I have to apply by and, and when is that decision made or what's that time period? Yeah, so there's two additional steps that need to happen here. Uh, we need to have an application on our website by a June 1st and then that window closes June 30th. Um, we would then make a decision on uh, what students have qualified by July 15th and provide notice to those families. And that's done. If there's more people who apply than we have space, how do we do that? We do it through a lottery. So it's just a random uh, lottery draw. And we have confirmation that the new middle school will be built and ready to roll on that third year. Yeah, 100% confidence in that, right, Jake? OK, no, excellent. Just, Thumbs I up. Can't, I can't say that. We haven't even started construction yet. <laughs> there's not a hole yet, so I'm just curious. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. I do want to note um, the question I think that was going to come up, and I heard a little bit with, with Mark's presentation, but even beyond that, uh, when you look at the high school um, uh, situation, uh, new students would we're not talking about availability at caps we're not talking about availability at the blue valley academy we're not talking about availability with the jccc courses uh, either so it only be our current students who are returning that those programs would be available to them and when you look at aspen grove elementary uh, chinese immersion would not be available uh, for those students either so, so let's just make sure i heard right so so if i transfer into 10th grade at Southwest from outside, from outside the district then my child's not eligible to take the joint or the dual credit with Johnson County Community College junior and senior no dual credit is credit you're getting at Southwest right what he was talking about is um, going to Johnson County Community College in the welding program and that's for the current year coming up so if they come in a sophomore then they follow and stay with us then they're our student so it's just that first year that they're not eligible for those programs so once just the first yeah year. once they're in there are students and we don't differentiate yeah. so if they started senior year they couldn't take any of the johnson county classes correct unless they were in the building like if, if i take ap government and i get that's dual credit i can do that it's just I'm not going to be able to go to Johnson County because that program is full already. Right. That's the, that's the, yep. the other program. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Or do caps. Caps would be full by the time that we en enroll them in June. We do have two motions. Uh, the first motion is the approval, um, essentially, of the enrollment report that you received back in February. Uh, that talks about um, the enrollment numbers um, and then uh, the other one is just the approval of the number of seats uh, that are open yeah going forward next year when we do an enrollment report in, in february we will have you approve it then we typically don't have the board approve that we give it um, but this is statute that they wanted approved so um, that's why we're, we've got to clean that up today and make sure we get that approved hey, Tanya, or either whoever um, is our policy consistent with what, what a lot of the other districts are doing across the state? Uh, I don't know that for sure. Um, I, I think the, the individual determination was, was really around the capacity issue. So uh, I, to my knowledge, uh, the initial approach from our peers in the immediate area is one to be pretty conservative um, because there are still concerns um, and some of those concerns Mark mentioned. Uh, a little bit ago yeah I think that um, 
at least one of our neighbors is not taking anyone. Um, I think their capacity is such they're growing. I don't know that for 100 percent, but um, we've all we're all maybe a little bit different threshold. Um, but everybody's taking a conservative approach. And um, we have any legal concerns? I mean, I probably can't talk about it, but you know, it, that's that may be my one concern. Is all the districts are like, eh, we don't really want to make this too easy. Um, I, you know, I think that we feel confident, as confident as you can, that we have followed the statute and that uh, we've worked with our legal counsel and our school board association to make sure that we've, and KSDE, we've taken all of the guidance that they've given us around what needs to be in that policy. And um, so I think we're as, as confident as we can be, Jim, okay. <laughs> with no certainty. So, I mean, are you saying that, because I know, you know, different school districts across the state have different needs and they may be, you know, less restrictive. Yeah, I would say some aren't taking any, though. I do know there are some school districts that aren't. And, and some school districts have been doing this for years, have been allowing it for years. I'm, I'm just... I think it's more about... We're a litigious society, so... Mm -hmm. Is it more about, like, we have these new buildings, so other, other that are mostly... In, not mostly empty, but because Southwest is quite full, but... Aspen Grow, for example, we're not adding sections for non-residents, and that's because the funding's not there. Well, the, maybe it might be. They're they're still working on current year funding. Um, I would say again, it's all around staffing. So, for example, at Southwest, you want to add, um, you know, 50 more ninth graders. Would there be space? Yes, but you're going to have to hire a biology teacher, which we're already struggling with. Right to find quality biology teachers. You have to hire another math teacher. We're already struggling with. Have to fire another English teacher. I mean, we would have to hire additional staff. So we are doing it based on the current staffing model we have. All right. Uh, I think we've got two separate motions. So um, I'll uh, entertain the first motion. I move the Board of Education approve the enrollment report, which in includes the number of students expected to attend and the capacity for each Blue Valley school for the 2024-25 school year as it was presented at the February 12th meeting. All right, do we have a second? Okay, motion by Patrick, second by Sonia. Any discussion? Patrick has... I'm voting. Oh, okay, sorry, I'm like, wait. Uh, all right, uh, all those in favor, raise your hand or say aye. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Jim, did I see your hand? Yeah. Okay, motion passes 7-0. Next. I move the Board of Education approve the pupil to teacher ratio and the number of open seats available for non-resident students at each school as presented. Motion by Patrick, uh, second by Jim. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7 0. All right, on to the next uh, item D, Casey Architects. So uh, I believe Jim had wanted this pulled off to be able to discuss this. Yeah, and before we talk about that, I just, I didn't get, I forgot to ask Jake to, I just wanted two questions on a, contract we approved it in the uh, consent agenda. It's just because it's a big expenditure and I thought you might summarize the $5 million contract with Staub Construction that we that we approved. Absolutely. I was wondering if you were going to ask about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that project with Straub Construction is a 2023 bond project, so it's a project already previously selected by the board, approved by our patron community. It's an 11,000 square foot weight room addition, a 3,200 square foot renovation to the existing rate room and lobby area. Um, includes, like I said, new weight room, a flex space, which will be used for girls wrestling, primarily when it's in season, but also for other athletics and activities. And then we'll renovate the existing weight room and turn that into a boys wrestling or shared wrestling room. 
Um, and this also includes the addition of a private changing room, an officials room, and the budget is 5.5 million. We added a little scope, and so the estimate, or actually the GMP is $5,615,829. Any other questions? I don't, um, we have some more types of yes, sir. Uh, renovations at other high schools coming up. Right? We do. Yeah, yeah um, this is really phase one of a, a phase two of a multi-year approach. So at Blue Valley North last year, we or last bond, we built a gymnasium addition. So this is the next stage. Um, we'll do the same type of thing at Blue Valley Northwest and Blue Valley High in this bond, and we'll be building auxiliary gymnasiums at Blue Valley West and Blue Valley Southwest in this bond issue. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thanks, Jake. Um, so then on to Casey Architects. Jim? I just asked this to be um, voted on separately. I don't, I don't see it as necessary expenditure. All right. Anyone like to make a motion? I move that the Board of Education approve the contract with Casey Architects LLC in the amount of $29,390 for a restroom study. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Motion by Gina, second by Sonia. Any discussion? All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes 6-1. Next is uh, Student Discipline Appeal Officers. I move the Board of Education appoint Greg Goheen and Alan Fogelman as additional Student Discipline Appeal Officers through the remainder of the 2023-2024 school year. Motion by Patrick, do we have a second? Second. Motion by Patrick, second by Clay. Any discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, raise your hand. Any opposed, same sign. Motion passes 7-0. And finally, um, Amplify. Jim, if you'd like to. Okay. So I'll going to summarize best I can, and then, Tanya, you can correct me if I get this wrong. We have a, a seven-year contract for curriculum resource in English language arts, and it's a, a mix between a uh, digital resource as well as uh, consumables that will be delivered over the course of the seven-year contract. The it's roughly $950,000 um, to be paid all up front. And so I think it's a, f a fine um, resource. I think the company is a, a good company. Um, but I'm, I'm not in favor of a seven-year contract. So we talked about it this morning. Um, you know, my concerns are it front loads all of that consideration. Um, I mean, I've been involved in software companies and business, I've never approved a seven-year contract, ever. Not as a legal advisor, not as a board member, and not as an executive. Uh, I just think it's a, too long a period of time to throw all that money up front. I, I, I think it's an unwise practice to, to, and I understand that they, the company, I would say this too if I were the salesman for Amplify, is we really just don't do anything other than all up front. That's bogus. I don't believe it. Um, and so my suggestion is we approve the contract uh, subject to the ability to take some of that consideration and and pay it over pay it over time. I'm fine with you know some significant portion up front, okay. but I think the balance should be paid over the course of seven years. They have physical delivery obligations throughout the course of the contract. Um, they can't recognize the revenue on their income statement until they perform in the year that it's performed. So um, I appreciate the need to, to have the resource finalized so that the district 
team can roll it out and plan, et cetera, et cetera. I just think it's an unwise practice to have to sign contracts and pay it all up front, particularly that duration. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. So, well, I was going to say, I, I think that, that uh, the administrative team did a little bit of research, and <clears throat> so we get a discount. We, we know we're going to do the seven years. We get the discount. And I, I hear what you're saying, because I'm in credit, I, I don't like to pay early either, honestly, right? Um, but we would be paying more. And, and they're not saying that we couldn't do a yearly. We can. We're just paying more every year um, than we would bundled. And correct me if I'm wrong, um, but that, that's what it is. I mean, we, we could do yearly. <laughs> we could also we, sign a seven-year contract yeah. and tell them to come back and provide us a payment cycle mm -hmm. that uh, gives us other alternatives. I mean, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to second guess people that have negotiated contracts. Um, but I, I would, as a, I don't know if it's a matter of policy, I, I just wouldn't be willing. I'm, I'm just, I, just, I can't su suggest it's a good practice at all to approve a contract where you pay, it's a seven year deal and you pay it all up front. So, Jim, a couple of quick questions. So, what's this for? What's it for? Yeah. It's an ELA resource. So, so it's it's a software, right? Right. So it's software. It's software and consumables. There's both. It's workbooks. Okay, so it's workbooks, but it's software, right? Yeah, it's both. It's both. So it's an IT contract. Part of it is an IT, and part of it is consumable. Right, but but it's learning materials, either digitally or or in a <clears throat> written format, right? Right. And so, what kind of discount are we getting? For the 950 up front. Yeah, I'm going to ask one of the curriculum folks who worked on it to come up and. So I believe the question is, what's the the discount? The discount, roughly. So if if we do a seven year upfront purchase, as opposed to doing seven one year purchases, the savings is a million dollars. And if we pay the extra million dollars, what doesn't happen? What, what do we not get to do? Or, or what are we going to do with that million dollars that we're saving? Oh. It's general, right? It would, it, general fund, right? It's learning resources fund. So we would utilize it for other resources, likely. So there's some learning that doesn't get to occur for a group of kids for that million bucks, right? I think the question, though, is because to me, there are two. Those are two opposite choices where you sign a one-year contract every year, and so versus signing a seven-year contract and paying for it all at once. And he's saying, let's sign the seven-year contract because we know we're going to use it for at least seven years, and we want them to be able to implement and plan and da da da, but but pay it every two years or. Tw you know, a payment now and a payment in four years or something to that effect. But we lose the discount, though, right? Well, that, that's not, we, we don't have that number. It's not the million dollars. That's, that's the one-year contract at a time. Mm -hmm. Is there another iteration of that? So it's a the million dollars savings correct, is the one-year contract right. paying it every year. Seven times, yes. Seven times, yes. Yeah. So, if it, so if it's seven one-year contracts, yeah. it costs us a million dollars more. Assuming no price increase over the seven years, yes. There could be a price increase also during that seven years, right? There could be a price increase over that seven years also, or not? It's possible, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. From a vendor standpoint, they've got development cost on the software immediate and everything else is much more profitable down the, down the road, but they need the money up front to be able to develop the product, as I understand it. Unless, well, you can tell me it's already sitting there? Yeah, it's a standard curriculum purchase. Uh, <clears throat> Does it need to be configured or is it off the shelf? It's probably off the shelf, right? <clears throat> the, the printed products would be off the shelf. The digital side, we would um, integrate within our system, but, but it is 
continuously being updated, upgraded, yes. So, so we're adding content or um, we're selecting what the digital side has, right, in it? The, the learning elements are something that we're telling them what to do. Are we personalizing it, Jennifer? We're, well, we can personalize and we can certainly give input to features we would like to see added, created, revised up for sure. So there's some programming, like Jan was saying, right? There's some programming on their side to, to give us what we want. So need. if I could liken this to our iReady math adoption that we have kindergarten through eighth grade, we have worked with the vendor in the year and a half of that relationship to uh, request things in reporting or um, uh, to make the product more useful for our needs, yes. So I would just reiterate that multi-year contracts in the world of instructional supplies curriculum, every time we bring those forward to you, you see a pattern of multi-year. Granted, this is typically you'll see a five-year contract. This is seven years. And as we sent you again today, that research, Jennifer went back to the vendor and we could split that into um, a three-year a three and a four-year versus the total seven year. I know um, Melissa is willing to um, assist as well regarding this this uh, contract, but the, the work Jennifer did today with the vendor is really, we're at this point where we, where we think was, we're at. Could, was that two, two contracts or uh, two payments? One contract, two payments. One contract, two payments, I think. Is that, no? Two, uh, we could do a three year contract or a four, we could split it any way we wanted. We could do seven one year. We could do a two and a five. Um, we probably would get the greatest cost benefit of doing, if we were comfortable, say a four year and following up with a three year, but that would be two separate purchases. So uh, if I can just, if I can read what the research that you did, just so everybody can hear it. Sure. Um, so, and thank you for doing that today. Um, Amplify does not offer an opportunity to adopt the resource with a partial payment upfront and annual payments thereafter. If the district is not comfortable with a seven-year adoption, the best option would be to split into two separate shorter purchases, for example, a four-year followed by a three-year purchase. The district would still realize some savings as compared to um, the seven um, one-year annual purchases. Um, but there's a good chance um, that we would likely incur a price increase when negotiating the second contract. So prices, prices go up, right? Mm -hmm. so. Have we worked with this vendor before? We have not, but we have districts um, near us who have and are pleased. Do we know how long they've been in business? Roughly. I mean, the, they have a lot of financial resources behind them based on what, what I looked at, but they did a Series C round in May of 2023. You only do Series C rounds when you are burning money and you're growing fast, right? And then your objective, I mean, this company will not be the same company even in three years. It'll be, it'll go through a transaction It'll go through another capital raise. So they're, It'll so go they're, public. Who knows? So they're growing by acquisition? Yeah, they're trying to grow their top line to right. be able to sell. So they're, they're acquiring companies and growing through that exercise. I think their, their goal is probably to be acquired just based on the, what I saw. But the, I, I, like, I'm totally comfortable with a seven-year contract. I just think that they should take it. I think they should work with us to, you know, they they have deliverables to us over the course of that seven years, so we should have comparable deliverables to them in the form of money. So that's just my perspective on it. So are you saying we could have a seven-year contract and we just make annual payments? Or some mix mass, you know, pay Two you payments, seven half a million up front and... Yeah. It, I guess the question would be, is it worth a million dollars? Well, that's the... We don't know the question. We, we, we don't know the answer to that question because um, 
they've kind of presented a well we're not going to offer you that will offer you a four year contract so if i look at the net present value of the million dollars over a seven year period it looks like a pretty good deal for us yeah but you don't you're not you're not comparing apples to apples you're comparing apples to an orange you're, so you're comparing a seven year deal paid all up front mm -hmm. to seven one year deals you're not comparing a seven year deal with different payments cycles mm -hmm. and the company's coming back and saying we only offer if we're going to do a seven year deal we offer one ab ab approach yeah. pay it it's all a, it's front. a financing question yeah that's what we're but, looking at but you, I, you don't question the company no I, right. well I I applaud their sales staff for being <laughs> getting it this far so I think they've got a really good sales and finance approach <laughs> and they know who they're dealing with which is they they know they're dealing with public entities which are good company a good parties to contract with for on a long-term basis they don't really have any risk in a seven-year deal with us if we pay up front and part of it over time it's simply about them it's, it's simply money that they won't otherwise have to go to investors and banks to secure are they otherwise financially solvent well they're financially solvent. I mean I don't know the inside of financials I'm just telling you they're not profitable but they got a lot of cash in the bank is my guess but they're burning that cash every month right and I'm sure it's a good company I mean I, I think that uh, that uh, Steve Jobs wife is involved in it so I think it's got some heavy hitters I, I don't question that I just um, I've been on the opposite side of that we only offer this and I we only offer this approach or you know and I, I don't know I I just think it's not a great uh, practice I, I'm not trying to kibosh a whole deal on when I wasn't in the negotiating room so I, I mean, I appreciate what you, you've said, Jane, for sure. Oh, yeah. She's been trying to for a while. Katie, were you trying to say something? Okay. Um, we know that this is a resource that our teachers need. We've talked about the timeline of the need for that. Um, Jennifer is just confirming if we need to, if the... Um, certainly we've discussed the risk associated with increased price over time our recommendation is to obviously go with this uh, practice tonight certainly hearing all of concerns if we need to adjust to a four-year to do that to ensure that our teachers get these resources and we can proceed with planning Jennifer's prepared to work further with the vendor um, to do that but again we we recommended the the seven the seven-year contract because of the savings realized by the district over time but here everything that's articulated this evening okay are we ready for a motion I'm oh. sorry I was busy writing I didn't know there was a question on the table so the seven-year price per pupil so that is the consumables for the seven years and the digital access would be a hundred and sixty two dollars the four-year price per pupil, same product, digital access, but for a four-year length, is $119 per pupil. And what is it per pupil on the seven-year price? 162. What? Not, not the seven one-year, but oh, the I'm sorry. seven. Oh, I'm sorry. Pardon me. Seven one-year. Oh, okay. Seven one year. The, the the price that you've brought forward. What is the per pupil cost? The per pupil. The one that you're recommending. Yes, that's the one hundred sixty two dollars for seven years. In one single payment. That's worse. Than one for one seven one. years. No, you have to divide that by seven. By seven, right. one sixty two divided by seven. Oh, okay. Yes, well, yes, okay. one sixty two divided. One I'm nine. sorry. Like yes. Camp. And then 119 divided by four. Pardon divided me. Divided by four. Okay, thank you. Yes. That, that was a little. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. 
Mm-hmm. So 162 divided by 7 is about $23 a year. And 119 is 29.75 per year. And in terms of real dollars, are we using 22,000? How many students are we? I think you have two options. One is, or you have three options probably. One is to we table it and you don't do anything and you ask us to go back and then we delay it with our teachers. Um, you vote as we presented it or you modify it in some way and we will try and do that. And if the vendor won't adhere to that, we'll have to come back to you in May. I, I would um, approve it subject to some ability to to pay a meaningful amount up front and some portion over time over the course of a seven that's, year contract i don't think that's an option that's so I, if we do that if, if you approve that and then we were go to the vendor and they just say nope we're not doing that then i guess we'd have to come back in may um, or we or we do a or do a that, or we contract? do a, we add it to a special meeting i mean I, i'm I get together. I mean, this isn't a long conversation, right? We call them tomorrow and we say, the we, board. We did that. I mean, we, that's what Jennifer did today. Um, I mean, we can walk away from this vendor. I think our teachers want it. Um, I, I don't want to walk away from the, the contract. I'm, uh, but I, it, it feels like bullying tactics on the be behalf of the, of the vendor. So, that's just my two cents. I don't. I've never heard a software vendor play hardball on a seven-year contract to say it's all got to be up front. I don't buy it. But it's just that's just that's just my two cents. And did I hear um, one of you say that these multi-year contracts, payment up front for three, four, five years, that's pretty standard in the industry that we pay it up front. We have the service or the products for five years, and then we go and renegotiate, whatever it is. So it is pretty standard. You guys feel comfortable with this company. You feel comfortable with the product. Um, school districts around our district have used it before. There's a good track record. Um, okay. That. So, so I again, I think you. The best option is either approve it or you ask us. If you don't want to approve it as is, then you tell us to go back and renegotiate it. That's what I would do. All right, does anyone want to make a motion or not? I would move to approve the contract uh, as presented. The, the seven year, uh, okay. Uh, motion by Jan, do we have a second? Second. Second by Sonia. Any other discussion? So I, I agree with Jim here that we should be um, asking them to negotiate for payments. I, I think the resource is great, and I know the teachers need it. I've been contacted by ELA teachers, so I just um, that's reflected in my vote. I, is there um, any issue with delaying this? For a month, are we going to be delaying in the resource we, that will impact teaching and instruction? You know, I know that our, our administrative team and others have put in a tremendous amount of time 
to make this recommendation they don't take this lightly and so i do support i do agree with you know jim's point for sure but i think knowing this world of of publishing and and software um this is this is kind of what happens so um and i also do the savings is important for me so um i honestly would support their recommendation of the seven year we're in discussion right now i think you know i think jim has a good point um my only concern is is paying up basically a million dollars up front um and what happens if they disappear i don't know if we have a lot of remedies other than bankruptcy court but um that would be my concern i mean obviously it's something that we need we think there's going to be a benefit to the kids uh certainly to the teaching staff um from that standpoint it can help them in what they're planning what what resources they need to move their classes forward um but that's a lot of money up front how do they deliver the consumables is that like an annual deliverable but does it change do you know Meaning, does the seventh grade what workbook are they updating the new editions every year? Only if there's a copyright change, and we inquire about that at the time of, of investigating and, and um, obtaining reports. Do you know what type of contract your partners have with them? I think we've got a motion out here. We've got, uh, we have it seconded. This was discussion. If there's no more discussion, um, all in favor, raise your right, raise your hand or say aye. Okay, so that I can't see Patrick. Is she, you're, yeah, okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that's five. Um, and then all those opposed, raise your hand. Two. Motion passes. Five two. All right. Was that it? All right, people. The April first, twenty twenty four regular Board of Education meeting has been adjourned. Just so you guys know, you have approved and I'll tell you you're just you approved a seven year I ready contract. Or maybe we'll a six year. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was like I mean, the first first. Uh, yeah, I mean, our first meeting, right? Yeah, we approved an eight year. You might not.